for our faculty um, just before school started, and we loved it. It was so good, and so we are so lucky that we got to have her come back and that she's giving this presentation to you. So you guys will really enjoy it. So we'll go ahead and let her. Thank you. I love it when they tell you advance. You're going to love it. <laughs> no pressure at all. I'm fine. Okay. So I love brain, like a ridiculous amount, which is kind of creepy and gross and weird. But what I love so much about it is that I also really love high school students a ton. And the more I learn about the brain, the more I love high school students and understand you better. And so what I want to do today is help you understand you a little bit better, if that's cool. Sure, why not? All right. So we're going to be talking about your brain and how it works. And most people don't really know how their brain learns new things. That's kind of a new thing for most people. I mean, we understand that we think a little bit differently, but we really don't understand how it works. And understanding how learning works in our brains actually really impacts kind of our attitudes toward learning and how we think we can do things, how well we think we can do things. So does anybody have a guess or already know how our brain learns? Awesome. That means we get to learn it together. Cool. So, gross, huh? It is really gross if you look at it in real life. Drawings aren't so bad. We're actually going to build a brain cell so that we can understand how that works. But we're going to build it out of cool stuff like marshmallows and licorice. Oh, okay. okay? Yeah. Now, here's the deal. You can't eat it. Yet. Okay? <laughs> because if you eat it beforehand, then we can't do what we need to do. So, I'm going to go ahead and pass these out. experiment called the marshmallow study where they took a bunch of four-year-olds and stuck them in rooms with marshmallows. It's hilarious. And it's on YouTube so you can watch it. Okay, so this is going to represent the cell body. So if you're looking up at that big diagram, the soma, that's what this is going to be for us. And basically, the cell body just like nourishes the cell, right? Keeps it going. Okay, reach in, find your sweet tart. Little ball of sugary goodness. Okay. And we're just going to totally unceremoniously shove this into it. So it ends up right in the middle somewhere. Doesn't matter. You can put it wherever you like. I will give you that power. All right. So can you guess what we just put into our soma? The circle thing in the middle. Exactly right. So what is that called? It's the brain of the cell, it really is. Okay, so this is your nucleus, right? Yeah, so the nucleus is like the brain of the cell that tells it what to do. Okay, grab your pretzel. <laughs> with attachments. Okay, and we're gonna shove this in one end of your marshmallow. So you end up with a lollipop looking thing. Ta-da! All right. This is the axon, and we're going to talk about it, what, what it does in just a minute, okay? So let's go ahead and empty out the rest of your baggie so that we can lay these down on the baggies. I don't know about you, but I don't like putting food on things that people touch. Okay. So grab your pull-apart licorice, and here's what I want you to do. Pull off four of the strips and leave the rest together. And just set those strips on your baggie. Now the 
five that we've got left together, we're going to keep the bottom all clumped up, but the tops we're going to pull down. Okay? So it's going to end up looking like that. He ends up looking like an alien at the end of Pretty Awesome. So we're going to take this, this is probably one of the trickiest parts of this whole process. If you want to lick it, you can, because it sticks better. Okay. And we're going to try and shove this in the top. So kind of wiggle it back and forth, smush it down in there. So he'll end up looking like that. This guy's like, oh darn, I accidentally got some marshmallow and I'm making it out. <laughs> okay. Now we get to open up our fruit roll, so go ahead and just put your neuron down for a minute. Open up your fruit roll and get it out of cell vein. Just kind of arrange them, maybe overlap it like an inch so they stick out the bottom of your fruit roll. Yeah. And now we're just going to roll this up like a blanket so that fruit roll-up is going to wrap around the pretzel, okay? So I'm just going to lay them down and wrap it up. into a little electrical pulse, like electricity that goes through a wire, okay? So that travels down through the cell body into the axon, okay? That's your pretzel, deep down inside there. So the pretzel, or the, yeah, the axon acts just like a wire, like a cable that we use for our electronics, okay? That's wrapped in what we call myelin. So your fruit roll-up is acting as myelin, okay? When we look at a cable that's plugging something in, is it just the bare wire that's showing? No. No. What does it have over the bare wire? 
some kind of plastic or rubber or something like that. And why is it on there? Yeah, to protect it and it yeah, it's non-conductive, so it doesn't let that electricity out of the wire, right? So the myelin does the exact same thing. It protects that brain cell, the axon part, and it makes sure that the information that we're passing down stays inside the axon. So if we don't have that myelin on there, then our brain doesn't work very effectively, right? Because those messages are all just leaking out everywhere. So that's going to be important to us in a little bit, okay? All right, down at the bottom, we have little axon terminals. And the axon terminals change the signal from an electrical pulse into a chemical one, okay? Reason being, there's a little space in between all of the brain cells in your head, and electricity and gray squishy matter don't get along very well, right? So it turns into a chemical, makes it across that little space, and then it goes to the next neuron. So what I want you to do is, at your tables, let's make chains of neurons. So just line them up in a straight line, and they always go dendrites down to axons, little space, dendrites down to axons. Good. Yep, perfect. Add yours on, okay? You'll space it out. They don't touch. There's a tiny little space in our head. Okay, can I get everybody to stand up? And come to the seat. Okay. Here's how we learn. I love that I'm shorter than all of you. Let me just stand up. Okay. Do you mind if I touch your neuron? <laughs> okay, so when we hear something new for the first time, these aren't lined up yet, okay? So our neurons are actually like hanging you know, out, doing other things. Now we're simplifying this tremendously. There are billions of these in your head, and every single one of those has about 200,000 dendrites on it, okay? So it's not like they line up in perfect little lines. But when we hear something for the first time, these particular dendrites and neurons and axons are not yet talking to each other, okay? So the first time we hear it, they kind of go like this. Uh, dude, are we supposed to be talking to each other? And if we never hear it again, they go right back, okay? You've never had that happen to you in class, right? The teacher says something, and for a minute you're like, I think I heard that. And then they ask you later, and you're like, no clue what you're talking about, right? And that actually happens physically in your brain. Your brain cells line up, start talking to each other, and then you never hear it again, so okay, whatever. All right? But the more we hear stuff, and the more we do with this, and the more we practice our math homework, or practice writing, or whatever it is that they're telling us to do, the stronger the connection gets between these, until they kind of get in the habit of talking to each other. So basically, they become this nice, strong chain of friends that are always hanging out and talking to each other. Okay? That's how our brain learns. So the biggest thing that we take away from this is that when we learn stuff, our brain actually physically changes. And we didn't know that before. So we thought, we don't know what we thought. We thought they were like nice little categories in our head, like buckets, and we put stuff in there. And that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah, little boxes. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Okay. But now we understand that when we learn something and when we do new things, our brain actually physically changes just like this. Okay? So are you freaked out that right now your brain is going? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to our tables for a minute. There you go. When you need a time to think, you can tell your parents, I'm sorry, you need to help have those. It's a good excuse. Okay. So, what we need to understand, beyond just the fact that our brain actually physically changes, is that different pathways in our heads do different things. So I hate to break this to you. No matter how much you like or dislike him, you have a Justin Bieber pathway. You do. <laughs> it exists. 
I'm sorry. Okay? <laughs> but our brain actually customizes the different pathways and even individual neurons for different bits of information. Okay? Now, when we talk in really general terms, the pathways that go back here, for example, they're for vision. So when we want to remember visual things, things we've seen, we create pathways that go back to what are called the occipital lobes of your brain. Okay? And when we want to remember things we've heard, that happens here in the temporal lobes. So we create little pathways through here. And when we want to create pathways about like what our personality is or projects that we have to do in class or whatever, that's happening up here in our frontal lobes. So all of the lobes do different things and create different types of pathways for different reasons. Okay? Now, on the next slide. Yes. Okay. We'll go back to it, I promise. I'm going to show you a time-lapse image of how these pathways develop just over time, over the lifespan. Okay? So as we learn new things in our lives, we create new pathways. But also, it kind of depends on how old you are. Okay? which pathways are being created. So I want you to watch and see which area turns blue last. Okay, here we go. This is the back of your brain, and that's the front of your brain up there. Okay, so what's the general pattern? Yeah. It starts at the back and goes toward the front. So we know that the front of the brain, those are the frontal lobes, okay, that develops last. When we start to talk about what the frontal lobes are responsible for, that list is pretty intense. Frontal lobes are the biggest lobes of the brain. They're bigger in humans than in any other species, okay? And they're responsible for things like planning in advance, consideration of consequences, uh, regulating our emotions so we don't freak out at our parents, um, I mean, just all kinds of stuff that's like super important, but it's developing last in our brains, which is kind of frustrating, right? Okay. At what age do you think those frontal lobes are fully developed? 25. About 25. 30. 30. You guys are spot on. Okay. So we used to think, even just 10 years ago, five years ago, we thought that the age was max 25. We thought it was 20 to 25 years old when people were fully developed. And now we're looking at like 25 to 35 years old is when a brain is fully developed. And that's not because we were wrong, but because brains are actually changing because of our environment. Okay. So lesson number one, two, six today. Okay. Brain physically changes when we learn stuff. There are different areas of our brain that do different things. But now we know that these frontal lobes of our brain that are supposed to help us, like, again, not freak out at our parents, those aren't fully developed yet. The parts of our brain that are supposed to help us look and say, oh, I've got a five-page paper due. I better plan that out and do it a little bit at a time so that I get it done by the due date. That's not quite developed yet. So a lot of the things that are expected of us on a daily basis, we're struggling with because they're just not quite hooked up yet in our brains, okay? And I know that can be really, really frustrating for you. So I mentioned that that age has changed, and what's creepy about this change is that it's really just happened in your generation, okay? And it's so big of a difference in how the brain works and how it develops that some of the scientists are actually calling it an example of evolution in one generation. Evolution usually takes millions of years, <laughs> and we're seeing it in one generation. Okay? So my question for you, of course, is why? Why do you think your brains are different from your parents' brain? Surroundings and what we do. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your surroundings and what you do. Maybe Good. Yeah, a lot of those basic function things that our parents had to like think through and be boring and stuff, they, we can just get. It's easy, right? Can you think of any other reasons? It's like the biggest part of our lives, isn't it? Well, it's hard to think past that. 
I mean, technology is where that's everywhere to go. Look at my ridiculousness. I have two devices over there. I've got one more in my bag. I've got some up back there. I mean, like, people laugh at me when I go places, okay? So we are surrounded constantly. What I want to do, though, is go through, we'll come back to technology, but I want to go through a few others that are causing some pretty big changes, okay? Cool. All right, nutrition is a huge one. What you're eating on a daily basis plays a major role in how your brain works. So I told you we'd come back to that myelin, your fruit roll-ups, right? <laughs> okay, that myelin is made of fat. I know, our brains are fat. That's pretty awesome, okay? But here's the thing. A lot of us engage in eating either a really low-fat diet um, or a really high sugar diet. And sometimes we combine the two, okay? That deprives our brain of myelin. So if we're not eating fat in our diet, especially fats that come from things like almonds and uh, salmon and things like that, so the really good healthy omega-3 kinds of fats, olive oil is great for you, right? Those kinds of fats go up and help build the myelin in your brain, okay? So if we're not eating those, that's a problem. If we're not eating at all, or if we have any kind of eating disorder or problem with food, okay, that actually takes off the myelin in our brain, and it's going to make it so that we're not thinking as clearly as we need to. Okay. Um, eating too much sugar also is massive. That freaks your brain out, okay? Because your brain is like, oh, lots of food, cool, cool, and then there's none. Hate you so much, and then there's more. And then goes, oh no, there's none. And your brain spends the whole day going through this ridiculous kind of roller coaster thing, and that's not good for its function. It really prefers to have just a nice, like, easy balance of energy the whole day, just like you do, right? You feel like crap if you're triggering down and triggering down, and your brain's doing the same thing. Okay, so we got to be careful about our nutrition and what we're eating, and choose foods that are really good for us and have those healthy fats in them. Our environment's a mess. Have you noticed? Yeah, you lived here last winter. Ugh, it was so gross. That was the worst winter I've ever seen here, right? So we've got really terrible stuff in the air that's causing us problems. We've got a lot of, a lot of nasty stuff in our water that's causing us problems. Um, so, I mean, that's not something that we can do a whole lot about in our daily lives. That's something that we might want to take a look at helping out with in the future as far as cleanup and careers in environmental conservancy types of field. Okay, so this is a huge one that I want to spend a minute talking to you about because I want you to tell your friends, okay? So when we're born, our brain's kind of like that one on your left, okay? So not a whole lot of neurons. What you're seeing there are neurons, right? Okay. By the time we hit about six or seven years old, our brain looks like that. It's a crazy mess. And then it starts to clean up a little bit. It starts to like organize things and get it all neat and tidy and get rid of stuff it doesn't need. Problem is, it goes through another cycle of this. And guess when this cycle hits? Yes. Okay, so I want you to feel really good about yourselves right now because you are awesome at a time in which you've got tons of brand new brain cells and hormones and very little emotional regulation. So the fact that you're awesome <laughs> is pretty amazing, okay? Because your brain's going nuts right now. So the thing that we're worried about with regard to drugs and alcohol at this age is that you have all these brand new brain cells and the dendrites on those brain cells are reaching out going, hey, teach me stuff, teach me stuff. Okay? which is great because you're in school and you need to learn it. But if we put drugs and alcohol into those little dendrites, what it does is it teaches them that that's what they're supposed to respond to, that that's what they're supposed to use. And that's really, really not okay because as the brain gets a little bit older and it's supposed to respond to different chemicals in your brain, things like dopamine, and endorphins, and those are really good chemicals that go up in your brain and help you think more efficiently. 
When that dopamine is released, and it's released less often, if your brain's used to drug and, drugs and alcohol, dopamine, which is one of those feel-good things, gets released less often in your brain. And when it does, those dendrites are going, uh, what's this crap? I don't know what this is. What am I supposed to do with it? And so this stuff that's supposed to help us think, our brain doesn't know how to use it. And instead it's saying, aren't I supposed to respond to drugs? Give me more of that. Okay. So by using drugs and alcohol during your high school years, it's actually negatively affecting your brain. And now we're getting studies that are telling us if it's really bad, like if kids are abusing drugs, especially in the like 15, 16 year old range, um, there's lasting like 20 years later, memory impairment and thinking problems 20 years later, okay? So this is a pretty huge deal. People that tell you that it like kills brain cells and stuff, they're not quite right. What it does is it completely changes the way your brain tries to use chemicals to think. And it's hard to change it back. You can. And that's a big message, right? We can physically change our brain. But it's going to be a little bit harder because we've trained it to act a certain way already. Okay. All right. Does that look like you ever at school? <laughs> Sleep. Here's another good excuse thing you get to use. Okay. So number one, guys, you've got to get the devices turned off half an hour before you go to bed. Okay. Otherwise, your brain is like. Is anybody texting me? And it's kind of freaking out, and it really has a hard time sleeping. So that's a really basic thing that we can do is just turn our devices off about a half hour before bed. But I do want to tell you that your brain changes again <laughs> when you get to adolescence, when you get to be a teenager. And what it does is, you know, in little kids, your brain, a little kid's brain tells it to go to sleep at about like 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And they start feeling sleepy, and they get really annoyed. All right, in teenagers, your brains don't tell you that you should be going to sleep until about 11 o'clock at night. So when you're up late and you're feeling like, I'm just not tired, yeah, your brain is actually saying, you're not tired yet, stay up, okay? And then what time do you have to be at school? Yeah, 7.40. So you get maybe, what, six hours of sleep a night-ish, if you think about it, yeah. Okay, how many hours do you think you need? Twelve. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Twelve, a million, and fifteen. Okay, now, about nine, nine and a half hours of sleep is how much a teenage brain needs because it's still doing, remember, all the crazy growth? So it needs about nine, nine and a half hours of sleep. So it's, it's a struggle for you guys to come to school every day at 7.45 in the morning. We know that. And we're working on, you know, long term and trying to find some changes that will work for you guys. Um, in the meantime, dude, take naps. Oh. Find time. <laughs> yeah, go home and say, Mom, the neuroscience lady told us we need to take naps. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really productive use of your time, though, to go home and take an hour nap. Um, so we, we acknowledge that that's a struggle, but there are things you can do, right? Turn those devices off, get them out of your rooms, and go to bed as soon as your brain will let you. Okay? Why do I have a clicker if I put it down? That makes no sense. Okay, yeah, here's your answer right here, okay? Everything's easy, okay? So we'll talk about the immediacy of information in a second, but things have gotten pretty easy comparatively. Um, as we look at what maybe my parents were like, right? My parents were born during World War II. Look at his face, he's like, wow, she must be old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... My parents were pretty darn strict, right? They let me fail at things. They challenged me. My dad's favorite answer when I said, Dad, what's the definition of this word was, go look it up, right? So he made me go do stuff, and it was so frustrating, but now I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you, Dad, so much. Um, because if we are always doing stuff that's easy, we're not challenging ourselves, then we're not developing this part of our brain. This part of our brain is all about challenge and thinking about things and trying hard. And when we fail at things, we are supposed to learn from that, right? And take it and use it and get better. But what we're seeing is a lot of 
parents that are being kind of permissive and letting kids do whatever they want kinds of things. Um, we're seeing a lot of parents who like if their kid's not, so they start soccer and two weeks in the kid says I don't like soccer so they take them out, right? And they don't make them stick with things and they don't let them fail at things and then say, okay, you didn't do very well today. Why not? Let's see why not. Let's figure it out. So we're kind of losing that ability to think through failure and to challenge ourselves. And this is something that we need to take personally and develop, right? You guys are old enough now that you can't wait for your parents or your teachers even to challenge you. You've got to say, okay, I'm not going to do the bare minimum. I've got to challenge myself or I'm not going to have the edge I need with my frontal lobe development to be you know, better than other people for college or for careers or whatever you guys want to go into. You've got to improve this part of your brain and to do that you've got to challenge yourself. This is my favorite. Okay. I'll let you read it. <laughs> there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're seeing, you know, quite a bit of nature deprivation. We don't have a lot of time to spend outside. And we know for a fact from numerous studies that spending time outside changes our brains. We see new things and we learn new things, so we're creating new pathways, but we also reduce our stress levels significantly when we spend time outside. Okay, just being out in nature, immediately your brain like floods with these lovely chemicals that just go through chill. It's cold. Okay? So we're missing that in our lives. So those really cheesy commercials on TV that are like, get out and play an hour a day, they're totally right. Okay? All right. You don't look like this after school, do you? Please tell me you don't. <laughs> Oh, sprawl. Okay. <laughs> All right. So exercise, yeah, it's good for your body, and that's awesome. But it also completely impacts your brain. So when you exercise, a couple of really cool things happen. Number one, oxygen, you know, that air stuff that we need that's really good for you. It goes up in your brain and wakes everything up and says, hey, think more clearly. Be more efficient. Do well. Okay? So if you're having trouble focusing in class, if your teachers will let you get up, move around for a second, sit back down, that actually gets some oxygen up into your brain. Exercise if you have time before school. Yeah, right. Okay, we need to sleep. Never mind. Exercise after school. <laughs> so it will help you if you exercise before you do your homework. It'll help you to focus and think more clearly because you've just oxygenated your brain. That's a cop's ring for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here's the other so cool thing that happens when we exercise, okay? So I'm a runner, run like 50 miles a week. I love it, it's awesome, okay? When I run, I make little tiny tears in my muscles. Do you guys know that? Okay, there's a chemical that goes down and repairs those tears. I'm gesturing here because I ran the St. George Marathon and I felt like my quads had been torn to shreds, okay? Chemical dose goes down, it repairs those tears, but it also goes up into our brain. And it goes specifically into an area of our brain called the hippocampus. And its job is to make new memories. It's to tell these cells to line up and talk to each other. That's what the hippocampus does. So exercise not only oxygenates our brain and helps us to think more clearly, but it also helps us improve our memory. That's huge. Okay, because when we have lack of sleep, it's negatively impacting that hippocampus. So exercise can help come up and make up the difference. Okay, a few more here. TV, okay, so we did the couch potato thing before because it's a lack of exercise, but TV itself is a problem. And the reason why TV in particular of all of our media is a problem is because what do you look like when you're watching TV? Show me, yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and that look signifies turning off the frontal lobes completely, <laughs> right? We're not thinking critically about the message of the program, generally, every once in a while maybe, but not usually. We're usually just kind of sitting there and absorbing it, which is fine for 30 minutes to sit there and watch a show and kind of decompress for a bit. But the average teenager spends four hours a day watching TV. 
right, for your brain to shut off your frontal lobes completely for four hours a day is not okay. So that, if, if you're going to get rid of any media device, get rid of the TV, okay? Because that one doesn't make you think at all. All right, so here we go, finally. The immediacy of information, you already hit it right on the nose, right? Because we don't have to think about things, we just look them up really fast, we're not activating those frontal lobes, and that could be a major contributing factor to this delayed development. So again, we've got to find ways to challenge our brain to think through things. See if you can think of the answer before you look it up, right? So find ways to really think and challenge yourself. For you, this is probably the worst thing, okay? Not just for our brains, but also for our mental health. So we spend a lot of our times multitasking. So you're sitting in class listening to the teacher and like texting under the table <laughs> so at the same time, right? No, you're not, because you have a no, pol no device policy, okay? <laughs> but does this ever look like you when you're doing your homework? Yeah, big time, right? Okay, so this results in something called continuous partial attention, which means that basically as we look at you guys, at teenagers, you're spending most of your time dividing your attention between a bunch of things, which means a couple things. Number one, you never really get to focus completely on one thing. Because always in the back of your mind, there's the text or what's going on on Facebook or what your friend said or you know all of these different things, right? So if you can never focus completely on one thing, well, that's where frontal lobe development happens. Again, challenge, deep thinking, all of that kind of stuff, that's where it takes place. So we really need to learn how to focus on one thing. But the thing that is perhaps even more concerning about the multitasking and this continuous partial attention that we see you guys doing is that um, it releases stress hormones into your brain. Okay? And a little bit like okay, for our caveman ancestors, right? if they were being chased by a saber tooth, then stress hormones were good because they made them run really fast. <laughs> So it's okay to have occasional stress hormone release. They can actually help us do better on tests, or like if you're a performer, they can help you perform better, right? To have that little bit of amped up feeling. But when you have that feeling over time, for a long period of time, which we're seeing more and more teenagers have because of this, it actually starts to eat away at your hippocampus. That part of your brain that makes memories, that tells these to line up, it starts to eat it stress hormone does. Okay. So not only are we not developing the frontal lobes because we're not paying attention, but we're actually permanently damaging our memory systems. Okay, not cool. So we've got to watch this one really carefully. And I find myself doing it too. Okay? I'm just barely not young enough to be one of you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, brain wise. Okay. Um, but this is, I mean, this is, this is probably the hugest deal we've got right there for you. Okay. I do want to talk about Facebook for just a minute. Has anybody been seeing the studies that are coming out right now about Facebook use? Okay. So Facebook use and depression are highly correlated. And the more time you spend on Facebook, the sadder you are. Why? Please. Because you see people out doing things and like you weren't invited yeah. or you're like, dang, I wish I could have gone and do that. Like Exactly. Yeah, so we spend so much time on Facebook comparing or wishing we were doing whatever the people were doing. We worry about how many likes we get on our posts, right? I, I am not a compulsive checker of my posts to see how many likes I got. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we spend all of our time on Facebook doing. I, I mean, we're not consciously thinking that, but that's what we're doing, really, is we're comparing ourselves with others. We're seeing what they're doing that we're not getting to do. We're seeing if they liked our post. And there's so much about comparison that we're seeing higher and higher rates of depression among teenagers. And not just from Facebook, from all of this stuff we've been talking about. If your brain's constantly stressed, of course you're going to have anxiety issues and depression issues. But those two disorders anxiety and depression, 
there's a five times higher rate of diagnosis among teenagers right now than there was in the Great Depression, guys. Worst time in our nation's history, you guys are five times sadder. Whoa. Okay. So these are things we gotta worry about. We have to worry about them. Because you are at an age where your brain is doing this, right? Tons of new brain cells. So if we get at this point in life and we often think, man, I screwed up for the last 15 years and I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do about it. But you are actually at the perfect time in your lives to change it. Because you've got all these brand new brain cells going, hey, teach me what I'm supposed to be doing. So if right now you can get in there and start teaching your brain cells that they're supposed to be focusing on things and challenging yourself and stepping away from the media for a bit every day and getting outside in nature, if you start doing these things to your brain, then you will actually physically change it, right? I put it up again because I love it. I think it's really cute. Okay? So by just doing the opposite of everything we just talked about, right? All that stuff that's hurting our brains, you can actually physically change the way your brain works. I don't know like, what happens sometimes, but if I don't go outside, like I have to go outside every day. If I don't, like say sometimes on Sunday I'll stay in, sometimes I actually start feeling sick for not going outside. Yeah. Yeah, you're actually, those stress hormones are like overwhelming your brain and making you feel anxious throughout your body. So these cells that we're talking about, they're just nerve cells, right? So your brain cells are just nerve cells. And we have nerve cells throughout our bodies, right? They go through our whole bodies. So if you have stress hormones flooding your bodies, they're going to get passed down the channels all the way through. And so you will. You'll start feeling sick. There's a part of your brain that's specifically responsible for your gut and how it feels. And so if it gets overwhelmed with stress hormones, yeah, you'll actually start see I'm doing it. <laughs> you'll actually start feeling physically ill from it. So we've got to find ways to step away from the devices only for a little bit every day. It doesn't have to be for huge amounts of time, but get outside, exercise, get as much sleep as you possibly can, stay away from the drugs and alcohol until your friends. Okay. <laughs> and challenge yourselves, and you can change how it works, okay? So now I get this cheesy slide. Do you like it? <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Okay, <laughs> do you have any questions for me? I'm a master of what's called wait time. You ready, wanna see it? <laughs> yes. Does your brain like work better if you're outside? Because I like one time I was we were camping and I had to do like a homework assignment just because I was thinking about it. And I like got it done really, really fast and so I thought about other assignments that I didn't do, yeah. like in the outdoors kind of thing, you know. And compared to how fast I finished that one while I was camping compared to the other ones, I'm like, well, I finished that like really fast, like that's weird. And then I went and did a bunch of other stuff, you know, because I was camping. Right. So it kind of just made me think, like, does your brain just work better outside, or what? It's, you know. For the majority of people, it does. Again, we get outside, the stress hormones go down, the happy hormones come up, and yeah, we can actually think more clearly and accomplish more. Now, I said for most people, because sometimes when we go outside, we get distracted a little bit more easily, because we don't spend a lot of time outside, and so everything's new. <laughs> We're like, oh, that's different. Oh, that's cool. Let's we'll squirrel at you, right? So that, that can be a problem for some people, but for most people, yeah, like I'll go out and work on my back deck and I get so much more done than I do in my office, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Yes? So what about people who have disorders like ADD, ADHD, OCD, yeah. bipolar? Excellent question. So they all work a little bit differently in your brain, okay? So it just kind of depends. ADHD and ADD are probably the biggest ones that we have to deal with in, in, while we're teenagers and stuff, just trying to get ourselves to focus on things. And so the annoying part of that is that a lot of the stuff that controls our attention, that allows us to say, no, I gotta focus on this right now, is housed up here, <laughs> right in our frontal lobes, okay? So ADHD does tend to get better as we get older, as we start to develop these parts of the brain, and there are definitely some strategies that we can work with to help us. Um, but yeah, a lot of those disorders are generated 
up here from this lack of maturity up in this part of the brain. Um, so if we can start working on strategies to improve it now, then by the time you reach adulthood, there's often a, a pretty good alleviation of symptoms. It's not as bad. Right. Hey, I'm severely ADHD, mm -hmm. like all over the place. Mm -hmm. And like hunting or fishing like really like helps me. Like I went hunting for doves on Monday yeah. and now I can like focus. Like I don't know, like why is that? It's that nature correlation again. You got outside, and especially wild nature. So when you get out, and you said you were camping, right? When you get out in wild nature, the effect is even bigger. So our backyards are great, and parks are great, but wild nature has like this huge, yeah, and it's lasting. It'll last for days, this effect of just calming us down. And the more we calm down, the more the parts of our brain that are supposed to help us focus are going to work better. But yeah. Now you have a reason like, oh, I need to go hunting again, Mom. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's up to your teacher. What's that? He doesn't. Then eat them. Okay. I have to go teach a college class. And I told them I'd be late for you. So thank you. Thanks, guys. We want to thank you so much for coming. That was great. Okay. Do I have one of those waters?